Hi everybody, this is James Tompkins and welcome to Lecture 8 of the International Finance Series. Often this topic is under the name Exchange Rate Parity Conditions and as we'll see it, it consists of two models, uh, the inflation model and the interest rate model and so I'm splitting it up into two lectures and I'll tell you why in a minute. But in any case, what I want to do is start off the way I normally start. Sorry if you're tired of this, uh, but it's really important to me that you know why we're doing what we're doing instead of, hey, here's another topic. So uh, what is the overall theme of this class? International financial principles as it affects firm value. Yes, I'm guessing if you've watched the other lectures that you've got that one. At this point in time, you're well trained. And value is a function of what two things? Risk and return. And what element of risk have we been looking at that one might associate with international finance? Exchange rate risk. Okay, basically why does the dollar go up and down in value? So that's what we're doing today in this lecture. We're looking at yet another reason as to why the dollar goes up and down in value. And by the way, not just the dollar, but as I've mentioned, we're using the dollar as a, a platform from which to also examine other types of currencies and exchange rate systems. So with that in mind, oh, and in the second half of this class, we're looking at managing that risk and managing it not only in the short term, but also the long term. And then not just managing that risk, but looking at risk opportunities, if you will, that exist out there. And, and I'm also not just talking about exchange rate risk, but we'll also be looking at other different types of international risk. With that in mind, let me get into the agenda. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about uh, inflation and you know, what is it and, and how does it relate to interest rates, do we like it, and so on and so forth. And then we're going to get into two models that predict exchange rates. Now, in this lecture, I'm going to look at inflation and the next lecture, I'm going to look at the interest rate model. And the reason I'm putting both of these together in the same agenda is because we're going to find out that the interest rate model is identical. I mean, completely, conceptually identical to the inflation model. Okay, so although I've split them up into two lectures, perhaps for convenience, it's really important that you understand this lecture before you go on to the interest rate lecture because they are so conceptually identical. And then as always in my class, to link theory with practice, as you know I use current events and we'll have articles and discussions and so on and so forth. So with the inflation model, specifically we'll be looking at the law of one price, purchasing power parity, how good is this model, and then in the next lecture the interest rate model, uh, interest rate parity, and the international Fisher effect. And, and, and some of these terms here are identical to some of these terms up here. In fact, at the very end, this will be in the next lecture, I, I will show you, I will have argued that they're conceptually identical, these two models, but I will show you mathematically, in fact, that they're identical. Speaking of which, you know, here we are, we've been looking at and doing this international finance class, right? And, and my guess is that you've been a little bit disappointed as to the lack of equations that we've had so far. It's been mostly qualitative. Well, we've, we're finally going to get into a couple of uh, der deriving a, a few equations here as it pertains to this topic. Now, before I get into it, it's really important in this class that you know the direction of what we're discussing. So for example, this lecture, is it about the impact of an exchange rate on inflation? Or is it about the impact of relative inflation between two countries, say UK and, and the United States, and their exchange rate? Well, it's actually the latter. Okay, so, so today we're going to be looking at, for example, say expected inflation in the U.S. is 3% and expected inflation in the United Kingdom is, say, 5%, then, then what impact would you expect that to have on the exchange rate? In fact, we already covered this one, right? The impact of the exchange rate on inflation. So, for example, let's say that inflation 
goes unexpectedly higher in the United States, say, say it goes up to 5%, then what impact would you expect that to have on inflation in the United States? Well, suppose the United States wants to buy those Toyotas from Japan. Will they need more yen with a weak dollar or fewer yen? I'm sorry, would they need more dollars when the dollar's weak to buy the yen? Or would they need fewer dollars to buy the yen to buy the Toyota? They'd mean more dollars, right? If the, if the dollar is, is weak, you know, hey, you know, now we need, uh, you know, a uh, dollar fifty to buy a hundred yen, whereas before maybe we only needed a dollar to buy a hundred yen. Okay, and so so therefore, if the Japanese, if they want uh, a, a hundred a million yen for their Toyota, then that'll mean we'll have to pay more dollars or fewer dollars if the dollar is weak. More dollars, right? And so that means prices are higher or lower? Higher, right? And so ceteris paribus, all else being equal, that makes inflation, that is, is higher prices consistent with inflation? It is, right? And in fact, if Toyota is coming in with higher dollar prices, then what does that say about Ford? Is it easier or harder for them to raise their prices at home? It's easier, right? If the competition's coming in with higher prices, it's easier to, for Ford to raise their prices. And so, so we've had that discussion, the impact of, of a weak or a strong currency on inflation in that country. But today, we're going to get into, well, what's the impact of relative inflation between two countries, specifically relative expected inflation between two countries and their exchange rate. So with that in mind, let's begin with what is inflation? Well, of course, you're going to tell me it's rising prices, right? And, and, and that's true. But logically speaking, what, what, what two things or factors, <laughs> be really sophisticated about this, would you have to look at where inflation would be the logical outcome? And that's a tough question because you, you, probably, you probably don't have any idea where I'm coming from. Well, well let, me, let me put it this way, okay? Suppose, suppose this is all the money in the world, so we have $1, and suppose this represents the economy, this pen, and so therefore uh, uh, this is the only thing that money can buy. Now, if that's the case, then what is the cost of this pen going to be? Be a dollar, right? Okay, so now imagine money grows. Okay, so the Fed prints a bunch of money and lets it out in the economy, and but, but the economy doesn't grow. Okay, so there's no real economic growth. So money is growing at a more rapid rate than the economy. Now, what is the price of this pen? If, if, if the only thing that money can buy is this pen, what will the price of this pen be? Two dollars, right? And so, therefore, inflation is the logical outcome when how fast money grows is more rapid than how fast the economy grows. Okay, so that's, that's one way to think of inflation. At least, uh, in my opinion, a, a, a simple way to think of inflation. So let's talk about the link between inflation and interest rates. And this is known as something as a Fisher effect. It, it's actually, you know, just, just, just a formula with a, with a fancy name. This guy, Fisher, came up with this. And, and not to, of course, undermine uh, his great work. So and in any case, the formula is uh, 1 plus the nominal rate equals 1 plus the real rate times 1 plus expected inflation or roughly speaking, you can think of a nominal rate being as real, the real rate plus expected inflation. That, that bar over the inflation is, is just a statistical, common statistical symbol for expected. So, so let, me, let me tell you what I mean by this. Let's say a bank offers a rate of 10%. They say, hey, you know, you uh, give us 100 bucks and in, in a year we'll give you uh, 110. So, so that nominal rate would be 10%. 
Okay, so that, that 10% is just known as a nominal or advertised or stated rate. Okay? Now, let's say that uh, you could break up this 10% into two components. Okay? Number one is you could say, all right, well, you know, if I'm going to deposit money in the bank, then I should at least be rewarded by how much I expect prices to go up by. So, for example, if prices, uh, if, the, if the cost of a hamburger today is a dollar, and it's expected to be a dollar four in a year, should I at least, if I deposit my money in the bank, should I at least expect to be able to buy that same hamburger? And, and, and I should, right? Or at least this is a conceptually a way of thinking about a component, one of the components of the 10%. Okay. So why do you get rewarded for inflation? Well, exactly that. Now, what about the 6% real reward? What does that represent? Well, a way to think about that is it represents, if you will, your, your willingness for being willing to defer consumption. Because when you're putting your money in the bank, what are you not doing with it? You're not consuming, right? And so just a thought process as far as, well, you know, I get so much for the fact that I expect prices to go up. That's expected inflation. Well, I, uh, the remaining part is my reward for being willing to defer consumption. By the way, is a bank ever going to say, hey, we, we pay a 6% real rate? They wouldn't say that, right? They would just say, hey, we pay 10%. And, and, and why wouldn't they say we pay a 6% real rate? Well, you might say, well, you know, if it, it, it doesn't seem that high. And if they want to collect deposits, they want to attract deposits, they, they may want a number that appears higher. But, but even if you wanted to borrow money, would they ever say, well, you're going to borrow at a 6% real rate? They wouldn't, right? And, and why is that? Well, because it's ambiguous. Because, you know, their view of what expected inflation is and your view of what expected inflation is, could that be different? It could be, right? And so what they'll say is we pay 10% and, you know, you figure it out if, if it's interesting to you. you. You figure out how much is for expected inflation and how much is for real, but 10%, that's what we're paying. All right, let's talk a little bit about, uh, about inflation. Do we like it? Now, that's a little ambiguous uh, because you might be wondering, well, you know, do you personally like it when you go and buy stuff or, or are we talking about from the country's perspective? So, so, so let, me, let me phrase that a little bit more succinctly. Okay? Do we like it from a country's perspective? So if we're trying to manage our, our country's economy, then do we like inflation? Uh, uh, inflation? Well, you're probably going to say, well, you know, it depends how much. And, and so let me give you some choices. Okay. So, so let's say, do we like high inflation? Do we like low inflation? Would we like zero inflation so prices do not change? Or, hey, do we want prices to actually go down? Do we like that? Deflation. So what do you think? Go, go ahead and take a vote. Oh, you want me to find low and high? Okay. Um, and I'm just making this up. Let's say low is say in the 3% neighborhood, and, and high is, say, in the 15% to plus neighborhood, 15, 20, 50, 100%. Okay, so, um, so low inflation around 3, 0 deflation. So what, what, what do you pick? Go ahead, take a stand. All right, well, let's, let's begin with deflation, okay? Can you think of any problems of deflation? Well, ha have you have you bought a? Uh, maybe you're watching this on on an iPhone, or maybe you're watching this on a laptop, or or, or whatever you're watching this on. Okay, have you? Um, let's say it's a laptop. When you bought your laptop, assuming you bought it, maybe it's a company one, but let's say you personally spent money on your laptop, okay? When you bought it, were you 
did you just wake up one morning and say, hey, I think I'll get a laptop. And so, so you immediately um, decided to fulfill your need and you went out and you got your laptop. Or if you're like me, okay, when I decided, well, I've, it's really time I get another laptop because some of the things that I need aren't working very well. And, you know, but I, I, I had an incentive to delay. You know, the longer I waited, the longer I could put up with whatever my old laptop was not doing for me, the better off that I personally as a, as a consumer was. So, so why was I delaying my purchase? Well, because my expectation was that for a given amount of money, say $1,000, that I could get a higher quality laptop or a, or a lower quality laptop. In other words, with more memory and more bells and whistles, etc., etc., the longer I waited. In other words, it was waiting in my best interest. It was, right? At least based on history. And, or, or similarly, uh, let's say that I wanted... A, a given quality level. I, I needed something with, you know, one terabyte in memory and, and so many RAM, etc. Okay, the longer I waited, ceteris paribus, would I be expected to pay more money or less money? Less money, right? At least if you look at the trend, the, the relatively long-term trend of, of what's been happening to the, the price quality dimension, if you will, of computers. They've been improving. So for a given price, high quality, the longer you wait. Or for a given quality, lower price, the longer you wait. And so, so if people have an expectation of prices going down, and therefore they're delaying their purchases, well, what does that do to people who are producing, or entities, businesses that are producing these laptops and producing this other stuff where you have prices going down? Is that, are they going out and making a bunch of them or are they, are, are they incentivized to hold off? Well, they're incentivized to hold off, right? And so that's happy face or sad face for economic growth? That's sad face, right? And, and so, so that's one problem, okay, with deflation is, is the incentive is for people to delay and that's, that's poor for economic growth. Um, another problem, stress, especially with you know, general overall uh, deflation, let's look at the, the financial crisis, which was you know, when the housing prices, the, the bubble just burst, right? And so imagine that, uh, that you spent, I'm just going to make up some numbers, imagine that you, uh, you have a house that you paid $200,000 for. Okay, so you pay $200,000 for this house. And let's say um, of that $200,000, you, uh, you put down $20,000, but you borrowed $180,000. Okay, so, so here's this $200,000 house, and you put down $20,000, and you borrowed 180000 And then the bubble bursts. And so now, let's say the value of the house goes down to, you know, maybe 150000 Okay. And let's say you, you haven't paid off very much, and, and maybe you still owe about 180000 So what does that do to your incentive to keep paying off the loan? Well, now some of you are going to say, well, you know, I made a deal and so I'm going to pay it off no matter what, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that's great. That's, that's very honorable. But is there going to be a, a section out there uh, either because, you know, they have no problem with breaking the contract or maybe they lost their job and they're forced to and they're going bankrupt. Is, is there going to be a sector out there that's going to say, well, look, I'm just going to have to walk away from the house? There is, Right. And so, so now you may have banks and various entities that are stuck with these, these mortgages or whatever that, that are defaulting. And so now that makes it more likely or less likely that, say, banks go under. It makes it more likely, right? And, and, and does that have, can that have a ripple effect throughout the economy? You've got people who are walking away from their, their homes and, and maybe they've lost their jobs and and because the economy is going down and, and it's, it's, it's 
you know, deflation is is stagnating the economy and, and banks are going under. My, my grocery stores start, start going under because people, they can't afford to stay or, or, or shop at that grocery anymore. In other words, is there a, a potential ripple effect? There is, right? So so that's <clears throat> that's one problem with deflation. That is, you know, Ceres Paribus, it's, it's not that great for the economy. In fact, Japan, they, they went through decades. I think that's a fair statement. And 89 was when their bubble burst. And yeah, I think decades is, is literally correct. They're still, to some degree, uh, struggling with deflation. And at least at the time that I'm talking today. And uh, so, so in any case, that's one problem. Can, can anyone think of another problem? This one's a lot trickier. Okay. Well, first of all, let, let's let's talk about how interest rates are used to manage economic growth. I, I've discussed this before, but I'll I'll remind uh, you in case you haven't watched previous lectures. But first of all, what kind of um, economy is more efficient? Okay. Um, so here we have <coughs> here we have uh, economy A and economy B. So economy A is you know the economy is going really quickly and there's a boom and and then it collapses and and then there's a bust and so on and so forth. Or economy B maybe it's just you know dra gradual steady. I mean there's still some peaks and valleys, but relatively gradually steady economic growth. What 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 is a better way to manage the economy, picture A or picture B? Well, it'd be picture B, right? Because because with picture A, you know, you've got the economy's growing really quickly and and people are being hired and factories are being opened and there's more money in people's pockets. In, in, in fact, inflation is used as a guide to, hey, I wonder if the economy is growing too quickly. Um, and, um, and so what is the Fed... What might the Fed do to slow down an economy that's growing too rapidly? Well, would they raise or lower interest rates? They would raise them, right? Because if they raise interest rates, then what does that do to the cost of capital? It makes it go up, right? And if the cost of capital goes up, does it make it more likely or less likely that the company will build those new plants or hire those new people. Less likely, right? And if that's true, does that then slow down the economy? It does, right? And so so th this is so that's how that's how you might use interest rates. You, you could raise them in, in times of boom, but this is inefficient because when when you're hiring those new people and opening those new factories and now and now you're heading into bus territory and you know you're laying off people. People that you've just spent years training and you're closing down those factories. Is that a very expensive way to manage your economy? It is, right? Which is why picture B is preferred. So now suppose that the economy is heading into recession. What would you do with interest rates? What would the Fed do with interest rates to try to um, pull them out of recession or help the economy grow a little faster? Would they raise or lower interest rates? They'd lower interest rates, right? Because if they lower interest rates, what does that do to the cost of capital? Does it make it more expensive or less expensive for companies, say, to raise capital? Less expensive, right? So does that make it more likely or less likely that building those new plants and, and hiring those new people would be positive net present value? And by the way, if you don't know what I mean by net present value, you can go to the corporate finance series and and that fills you in on that stuff but in any case would it make it more likely or less likely that build those new plants and hire those new people if the interest rates have gone down make it more likely right and so therefore that would help or hurt economic growth it would help right and so the point is is that interest rates are they uh, are they part of monetary policy power? Is is that a way to help control your economy? It is right. 
And so one more thing, when the Fed says, all right, well, we're going to raise interest rates by half a percent, that half percent, is that a nominal rate or is it a real rate or is it expected inflation? Well, it, it, it's nominal. They're not going to say, well, we're going to raise it by a half a percent real rate. I mean, later on, we'll have a discussion about, or actually in the next lecture, we'll have a discussion about, well, when, when the Fed raises rate, is, you know, w w what would you expect that to be? W would you expect that to be dominated by a real change or expect inflation? We'll have that discussion, but the point is, is that on the surface, it's a nominal rate. So now let's link this to one of the problems with deflation, okay? So here's the clue, okay? The nominal rate is equal to what? Well, we said earlier that the nominal rate was equal to approximately, yeah, real plus expected inflation, right? So the nominal rate is equal to real plus expected inflation. So if we have deflation, then this number right here is going to be what? Positive or negative? That's going to be a negative, right? Okay. That's going to be minus apostrophe V. That's going to be negative. And if this is negative, that means this nominal rate, is that going to be a big number? Is that likely to be a big number or more likely to be a small number or maybe even close to zero? Well, it's going to be a small number, right? Maybe even close to zero. And if it's close to zero, then, then, then what control do you lose? Suppose, like Japan, your economy was heading into recession, and their rates have already been lowered to zero. Do they lose the power if your rates are already at or near zero to try to boost the economy by lowering it more? They pretty much do, right? In fact, as we discussed in earlier lecture, that's why Japan, relatively ineffectively as we saw, that they were trying to boost their economy by managing the exchange rate. So here they are, you know, trying to weaken the yen. And why would they weaken the yen again? Well, they're, they're a, a, an export-driven economy, right? So, so they would like a, a weak yen or a strong yen to make it more likely that we would buy, the United States would buy their Toyotas. They would like a weak yen, right? That way... We don't need as many dollars to buy their yen to buy their Toyotas. And, and so what they were doing is that they were uh, printing yen or taking yen out of the back room or whatever, in, in any case, taking those yen out onto the exchange rate markets and buying dollars, thus creating a demand for dollars and at the same time increasing the supply of yen for sale in the market, which weakened the yen. But if you recall the charts we looked at, if, if this is the Japanese government and, and this is the market, then, then who won that battle? The market did, right? Because when the yen went through a, a, a rapidly strengthening period, in spite of the government's intervention, it still continued to strengthen pretty rapidly. And so losing this monetary policy power because your interest rates are at or near zero is a huge problem when it comes to deflation. So to sum it up, deflation, happy face or sad face? Sad face, right? I mean, number one, it hinders economic growth because people want to delay their, their purchasing and therefore manufacturers delay their um, manufacturing. And number two, you lose some degree of your monetary policy power. And so that's one of the problems with uh, deflation. So, so what, about, um, what about zero inflation? Why wouldn't you want zero inflation? Well, I like to think of it this way. I remember a long time ago, this is not a sea story, but hey, it's a story. I remember a long time ago, I was driving in the Grand Canyon area in the United States and I, I pulled over to one of those scenic view signs and got out of my car and walked to basically the edge where you could see this incredible view of the Grand Canyon. And if you look straight down, it was just you know, a, a, a really big drop, okay? You, you wouldn't want to drop down there. 
And so I personally, I was pleased that they had this, this fence where that, that stopped you, that, that left a little bit of a margin, if you will, so nobody would accidentally walk too far. And that may be an analogy with zero inflation. Because if you have zero inflation, are you right on the border of deflation? You are, right? And that's a vicious cycle. Once you get into that deflationary cycle, that can be a vicious cycle. As soon as people have an incentive to delay, then it, it's tough to pull yourself out of, out of that. I mean, just, just ask the Japanese, right? And so, so that's, a, that's a problem with zero def inflation. It's just, just too close to the border. It's right on the border of deflation. So then the next problem is this high inflation. You know, let, let's talk hyperinflation. Now, wh why is that bad? Well, I remember working with, um, at FMC, as I mentioned in lecture one, when I introduced myself, uh, multinational, multi-product firm, so operations all over the place. And they, they had, I assume they still have, operations in Brazil, and they had them when Brazil was going through a hyperinflationary environment. So it is possible to do business in a hyperinflationary environment. However, ceteris paribus, is it more risky or less risky? It's more risky, right? Because there's, that's much more of an unexpectation or much more uncertainty, I should say, regarding prices. A price is going to go up, you know, 100% or 120%. And, and also, you know, and, and so if, if the riskiness goes up, what does that do to the cost of doing business in that country? Does it increase it or decrease it? It increases it, right? And so that, that's a problem with high inflation. There's another problem, too. This is one that uh, my cousin pointed out to me. As I mentioned to you, he has a, and has had for three decades now, a boat building business in Zimbabwe. And if you recall from lecture four or five, the, the one on international monetary systems, you know, Zimbabwe essentially bankrupted themselves out of even being able to have their own currency anymore. Okay, but back when the Zimbabwe dollar existed and they, they had hyperinflation for if you're interested, go back to that lecture and, and it's explained. But in any case, um, he, he tells a story about how you, um, the, how contracts to buy stuff was just incredibly short. So in other words, he told a story about how he had a contract to buy, I forget what the raw material was, let's just say it was steel. So to buy, say, you know, a ton of steel at, at, the, at a particular price, and it was only good till noon the next day. And so he sent one of his workers by bicycle to go get that contract signed so the price of the steel was locked in. And the worker had a flat tire on the way. And because of that, missed the noon deadline. And so the steel ended up costing millions more than it otherwise would have. And, and the big point that he raised to me that made me think, wow, that, that's a really good point, is that in a hyperinflationary environment, do you have the luxury about thinking about it? Could you say, well, yeah, maybe I'll buy this steel, maybe I won't. Maybe it's a good price, maybe it's not. Do, do you lose that luxury? You do, right? And so that's, that's a problem with high inflation. And so, what does that leave us? That leaves us low inflation. There's, there are a couple of schools of thought, other schools of thought, in addition to why low inflation adds a little bit more flexibility when it comes to adjusting wages. But uh, I'm going to, we'll, we'll skip that. But, um, that. That may be more theory than, than practice. But, but in any case, by default, that leaves low inflation. So, that's a little bit of a discussion about inflation. So what I want to get into now is the inflation model. And again, remind me, are we talking about the impact of exchange rates on inflation or the impact of relative inflation on exchange rates? The second one, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to be saying, hey, you know, say expected inflation in the U.S. is 3% and expected inflation in the U.K. is 5%. 
then what would the expected exchange rate be based upon that information? Okay, so we're looking at the impact of relative inflation on exchange rates. And we'll look at what's called the law of one price. I'll explain what that is in a minute and purchasing power parity. And then we'll look at, well, how, how good is this model? So let's start off with the law of one price. So what, what would you guess it is? If you had to, you know, guess, you know, say for an A in this class, huh? what's the law of one price? Well, first of all, what do you think is meant by one price? Well, a single solitary price, you know, one price. So, so in other words, this pen, it does not cost $3 as well as $5. It just costs, say, $3. Okay, that's one price. N now, now put that in an international setting. Okay, so that's basically saying, okay, right, right, well, at a point in time, this pen should cost $3 in the States and the same amount, the exchange rate should be such that in Mexico it should cost the same amount. So basically the law of one price, and there's a, there's a couple more wrinkles, right? But the law of one price basically says that at a given point of time, there's just one price for an item, okay? So it should cost the same no matter what country you're in, and the exchange rate should be such that it's going to cost the same. So with, with, with a couple wrinkles that I'll mention in a minute, that, that's the law of one price. Another way of putting that is a gallon of gas, say in Atlanta, should cost the same as a gallon of gas in Mexico City. By the way, do you think that's true? Do you think a gallon of gas in Atlanta, after you adjust the exchange rate, is going to cost the same as a gallon of gas in Mexico City? Well... Let's, let's come back to that question. Let me make it even simpler. Let, let's, let's even ignore exchange rates for, minutes, for a minute. A gallon of gas in Atlanta and say a gallon of gas in San Francisco. So do you think they cost the same? They don't, right? Where, where do you think it costs more? Well, I don't know this for a fact and it's been a long time since I've been to California, but when I did go to California, I remember that, wow, gas is really expensive here compared to, say, Texas. I was living in Texas at the time. And, and so in any case, my, my guess is that gas in San Francisco costs a whole lot more than gas in Atlanta. Why do you, what do you think the biggest reason for that is? Well, I'm guessing taxes, right? So, so in other words, we've got some transaction costs. Do you think uh, so? That, so that would obviously impact the law of one price. If we get if we get back to an international setting, we've got Atlanta and Mexico City. Can you think of another reason that we would have to adjust the law of one price other than transaction costs? Well, what about transportation? Right. I mean, Atlanta is inland, and maybe Mexico City is is closer to where gas is, is uh, refined and so on and so forth, okay? In any case, the law of one price basically says that for an identical item, so for this pen, excluding transaction costs, things like taxes, excluding transportation costs, that the price of, a sing of an identical item should cost the same, and it's the exchange rate that makes it cost the same. Now, if that were not true, then what kind of opportunity would exist? In other words, if after I adjust for the exchange rate, I could buy this pen in the US for $3 and maybe in Mexico for only $2, what kind of opportunity would exist? An arbitrage opportunity, right? Because what could people do? What, what, where would they buy the pen? If, if after adjusting for exchange rates, this costs $2 in Mexico and $3 in the U.S., what, what, would, where would, what would people do? Well, it's like our free trade uh, lecture, right? I think that was lecture two. Basically, they would buy this pen in Mexico. They would ship it to the U.S. and sell it for $3. And, and that'd be like an arbitrage opportunity. But if everybody's doing that, 
if everybody's buying in Mexico, what would you expect to have in the price in Mexico? Well, it may go up, right? And if everybody's selling in the U.S., what would you expect to have in the price in the U.S.? Maybe go down. And so maybe that continues until in equilibrium, the, the price settles in equilibrium where there are no more arbitrage opportunities. In any case, this model assumes, here's an assumption, which is, by the way, is really important. This, this model assu assumes that prices adjust until there are no longer any arbitrage opportunities. And the reason that I stress the assumptions is, is why? Can you guess why? Well, only by understanding the assumptions can you infer the circumstances under which you would expect this to hold true in real life, in practice. In other words, it's, your understanding assumptions are relevant to bridging theory with practice. Let me give you a quick example. Okay, let's say oil. Okay, ceteris paribus, all else being equal. Would you expect the law of one price to hold for oil? You probably would, right? Because it's very, if, if oil was being sold at a really cheap price in, in say, uh, South America, and it was being uh, um, sold for a very expensive price in the United States, well, it's just a simple matter of, of taking a tanker and buying it in South America and shipping it to the U.S. That's, that's easy to do. But what if you had a, a five-star hotel room in, say, New York City, Manhattan, and a five-star hotel room in Thailand? Even after you adjust for exchange rates, would you expect the price of those two hotels to be the same? You wouldn't, right? And, and, and one of the reasons as to why not is because of this whole notion of prices adjusting until there are no longer any arbitrage opportunities. Could I, could I pick up the hotel in Thailand and put it on a ship and take it to New York City and, 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 and you know, take advantage of that arbitrage opportunity? I couldn't, right? And, and so that, that's why I stress that assumptions are so important to using reasonable judgment when it comes to bridging theory with practice. Okay, so let's take a look at the law of one price. And, and by the way, what I'm about to go over now, okay, is if you understand this diagram right here, all the equations that we're going to drive for both the inflation model and the interest rate model, which comes in the next lecture, uh, are, are going to make sense. In other words, you should be able to logically derive them as opposed to memorize them. So let's take a look at this situation. You know, law of one price, so at a point in time, so here we have time zero, let's say today. And so imagine we have an identical book that in the U.S. costs $10 and in Mexico costs 100 pesos. And so the law of one price says, well, I should be able to take my $10 to Mexico exchange it for 100 pesos and buy that same book. In which case, the exchange rate today is going to be how much? Well, 10 pesos or a dollar. In other words, a ratio of prices today. So in other words, the exchange rate today, per the law of one price, is simply the ratio of prices today. And if, like I said, if you understand that, if that makes sense to you, then everything else, you know, all the equations that we're going to drive moving forward will make sense just from this, this diagram right here, which I will extend when we get into purchasing power parity. But first, I want to talk about The Economist because, you know, a long time ago, they, you know, in a lighthearted fashion, they came out with the Big Mac Index. They say, hey, you know what? Big Macs are sold all over the world. In fact, McDonald's, if I'm not incorrect, was one of the first multinational corporations to, to really be all over the world with a similar product. I, I could be wrong about that. That's just my perception. I just remember when I was a boy in Belgium that McDonald's arrived while, while I was there. So they've, they've been around for a long time. 
In any case, they said, hey, let's, let's just for fun, you know, look at this law of one price thing with, uh, with a Big Mac. So, for example, in, in a recent Economist, they said, all right, well, the average Big Mac price in the U.S. is $4.62. And in China, it's 16.61. So if we look at the implication, you know, at a point in time, the, the exchange rate today should be a ratio of what today? A ratio of prices today. And so if we take this ratio, you know, if I can exchange $4.62 for 16.61 per the law of one price, they're saying, all right, well, the exchange rate should be 3.641 per dollar. Now, if the actual exchange rate was 6.051 per dollar, is the Chinese yuan overvalued or undervalued? Well, well, let me ask you this. You know, the law of one price is saying, well, it should be 3.641 per dollar. Okay? But it actually takes more one to buy a dollar. So would the model predict that it should move in the direction of 3.64? In other words, take less one to buy a dollar? That, that's what it's predicting, right? In which case, if it takes more one than it really should, if it's taking six one to buy a dollar, but it should only be taking about three and a half one to buy a dollar, would that suggest the one is currently undervalued or overvalued? Undervalued, right? Okay, so, so per the Big Mac index, per the law of one price, you would expect, you know, here, here's the actual, it's about six, and here's what it should be. So in other words, is the one expected to appreciate or depreciate? Well, if it's, ex if it's expecting that you don't need as many one to buy the dollar, then would that be an expected dollar strengthening or appreciation or, or weakening? Strengthening, right? So, so how, how do you figure out the percentage? Well, you know, take the difference and, and, and divide by the base. So, so that you, you would say it's 40% undervalued. Now, by the way, what, let's think about this assumption again with the whole Big Mac thing. So <clears throat> what do you think is driving this, this difference? Why isn't it holding with the Big Mac? Well, first of all, we know that China intervenes in the market, right? So that's, that's one reason, okay, because you know, the law of one price you know, assumes that the, the, the market will drive the exchange rate, okay? Because after all, is, is buying Big Macs, is that a market-driven activity? It is, right? So all this government intervention, that, that, that's going to make a difference. But what is it about the, even if that weren't the case, even if China said, all right, we're going to let the currency float, and maybe it's been floating for years, whatever. Um, what is it about the cost structure of the Big Mac? In other words, everything that goes into producing a Big Mac, what about that would you not expect the law of one price to hold? Well, let's, let, let's look at the component. What, what goes into producing a Big Mac? Do you need beef? You do, right? Bread? Yeah. Lettuce? Okay, so all of, all of those things, you know, those kind of things, would you expect, relatively speaking, would you expect those kind of things to adjust until there are no longer any arbitrage opportunities? Relatively speaking, you probably would, right? So, so if bread was relatively cheap in China and expensive in the U.S., could you put it on a plane and, and take advantage of that price difference? You could, right? I, you know, perfectly, no, but relatively speaking, yeah. At least compared to the next two points, what about, what about labor? Is that involved in selling a Big Mac? It is, right? So, so what is China known for? cheap labor, right? So could McDonald's say, hey, we've got this cheap labor in China, let's just fly them over to the United States and they can do the day shift and then we'll fly them back. Do you see that happening? 
you don't, right? In other words, prices, when it comes to the labor component, prices will or will not adjust, or is it, is it a bad assumption in real life to believe that prices will adjust and there are no longer any arbitrage opportunities, at least in the short term, when it comes to labor? Yeah, it's going to violate it there, right? It's going to violate that assumption. What else goes into producing a Big Mac? Well, what about the building it's sold in? Hmm? I mean, if, if buildings are relatively cheap in China, I'm not saying they are, if, if they're relatively cheap in China and relatively expensive in the U.S., could you, could you fly it over to the U.S. And, and, and see prices adjust until there are no longer any arbitrage opportunities? You wouldn't, right? So those are both reasons why, given the cost structure of the Big Mac, why you would not expect the law of one price to hold. All right, let's look at purchasing power parity. Okay, now the law of one price is at a point in time. Purchasing power parity basically says, you know what? The exchange rate is expected to adjust over time such that the law of one price holds. So let's, let, let's take a look at that. Suppose, suppose we've got expected inflation in the U.S. being 2% and Mexico being 6%. Okay, now, now if, we, if we had that information, could we predict expected prices, say, in a year? We could, right? And if we can expect, if we can uh, calculate expected prices, does that mean we can calculate expected exchange rates? We can, right? Because what do we say? We said that the exchange rate today is a ratio of what today? A ratio of prices, right? So if the exchange rate today is a ratio of prices today, then the expected exchange rate tomorrow is a ratio of what tomorrow? A ratio of expected prices. Let me show you what I mean. Okay, so here's, here's, the, here's the identical item. We're back to the book. And here's today. And let's say that book costs $10 today in the U.S. and $100, I mean 100 pesos today in Mexico. So the exchange rate today is a ratio of what today? A ratio of prices. So I've got 100 pesos to the dollar. So 10 pesos to the dollar. And I want to figure out the expected exchange rate. Well, if the if expected inflation is 2% in the United States and that book costs ten dollars today, can I can I figure out what the expected cost or expected price of that book is going to be in one year? I can, right? Just ten dollars times one plus 0 0.02, or in this example, ten dollars and twenty cents. Can I do the same thing with the price of the book in Mexico? I can, right? So it's 100 pesos today. The expected inflation level is 6%, so that means 100 times 1 plus 0 0.06. That means that this book is expected to cost 106 pesos. So in other words, the expected price of the book in the U.S. is $10.20. In Mexico, 106 pesos for this same book. And so should I be able to should I expect to, I should say, take $10.20 and convert it into 106 pesos to buy that same book? I should, right? So in other words, the expected exchange rate is a ratio of expected prices. If you understand this diagram right here, like I said, then with both this inflation model as well as the interest rate model, because the interest rate model is conceptually exactly identical. Exactly identical. The, the, the only thing is the inflation model is about stuff, right? Stuff, things I can kick. But the interest rate model, and I'll elaborate this more in, in the future, is about pieces of paper. Pieces of paper that we call financial securities. Okay, so for example, I owe you ten dollars okay this is that's a financial security okay that's that's what the interest rate model is about quote unquote identical financial securities conceptually these two models are exactly the same and so if you understand this for stuff you will also understand this 
for financial securities, which is what the interest rate model is all about. So could we continue this? I mean, for example, what if we said, well, what if expected inflation in year two is 5% in the US and in year two is 10%? Could I figure out expected exchange rates in two years? I could, right? I'd calculate a ratio of expected what? Prices in two years, right? So if I did that, well, you know, here we have 100 pesos for $10, which, by the way, is that the original exchange rate? It is, right? That's like E0, if I called E0 the expected exchange rate time one. And then I'm multiplying it by 1 plus 0 0.06, the expected inflation in Mexico. And again, by 1.1, 1 .1, the expected inflation in Mexico in year two. So here's the expected price of the book two years from now. So 116.6 pesos. For the US, $10 today, 2% expected inflation in year one, 5% in year two. So here I have expected $10.71. So in other words, the expected exchange rate in two years is a ratio of expected prices. So if we apply symbols to this, what we can say is the expected exchange rate at time one or time two, whatever it is, is today's exchange rate times this ratio of one plus expected inflations. Now, books going to want you to memorize, well, well, what goes on top and what goes on the bottom? You know, do I have Mexican inflation on top or do I have U.S. inflation on top? Or, you know, it, it's, and, and, you know, I, I don't want you to do that. You know, what, what, what makes sense? What, first of all, what goes on top? Or does it depend? Depends, right? So if we're working in pesos per dollar, so pesos on top and dollars on the bottom, then, then what expected inflation will I have here? Mexican or U.S.? Mexican, right? Because that's the units that we're working in. So, so that's basically the inflation model. So now we get a good sense of the impact of relative inflation between two countries, relative expected inflation, I should say, between two countries and their expected exchange rate. Next question is, well, how good of a model is this? And it's going to depend upon whether you're talking about, you know, long run or short run and, and also how big those inflation differences are. And when I say long run and short run, um, th that's a matter of opinion. That's a matter of judgment, whatever that is. Maybe, maybe long run is, is uh, six months, maybe it's five years, okay? Uh, m maybe a better way to put this is longer run versus shorter run. There's no clearly defined line that tells you what is long, what is short run. So, so let's say, let, let me talk about inflation differences, and that's a similar concept. So, so here we have, say in the U.S., we have expected inflation of U.S. of 3% and, and say U.K. 4%. So, so, so that would be, that'd be an example, relatively speaking, of, of a small inflationary difference. Whereas the difference between the U.S. and, say, Venezuela, that 3% and 50%, that, that would be considered a hyperinflationary difference. And so the question is, well, how, how good is this model, okay? And, well, let's, let's think about it, okay? Um, so, so let's talk, first of all, long run versus short run, okay? If, if something is out of whack, okay, if, if, if there is, uh, if the prices are out of whack, say, say the, with, with expected inflation, and, and it's, so it's not doing a good job in predicting, under what circumstances do you think it has a better chance of moving towards the equilibrium price of where it should be, according to this model? When it has more time to get there or less time? Well, presumably more time, right? I always think of this story. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but when, when I read in the paper that oil prices are going up, and I go to my local gas station to fill up my car, 
does the price go up pretty quickly? Yeah, it seems to me that, wow, it goes up pretty quickly, right? But on the other hand, when I read about oil prices going down in terms of barrels per oil, does it seem to be taking its time in, in prices going down? Well, at least my perception, it, it is. Maybe I'm just a pessimist or whatever, but it, that's my perception. That'd be an example, by the way, of sticky prices. But it does illustrate the point that I'm making, that if, if you have more time, then that also means more time for the price in equilibrium to go to where it, quote-unquote, should go. So basically, in, in the long run, the predictive power of this model is pretty good. Now, what about moderate versus hyperinflation? What packs more information? I mean, we're looking at inflation as a reason for why the dollar goes up or down in value, right? So, so if I if I pick my the same two numbers that I used before, U.S. I think I had expected inflation of three percent, and the U.K. five percent. I should say three numbers. Venezuela fifty percent. Okay. So, so the difference that we have between the U.S. and the U.K. is 2%, and the difference that we have between U.S. and Venezuela is 47%. Okay, so, so if, I, if I look at these numbers, right, we have this difference being only a 2% difference between the U.S. and U.K., and here a 50% difference. Okay, so... What packs more information? The 2% the difference or the 47% difference? Well, presumably the 47% difference, right? That's a lot of information. That's, that's huge. I mean, that's like, what, what, what would be um, more significant to you if I say, hey, you know what? I'm going to snap my fingers and the value of your bank account is going to go up by 47%. Or I snap my fingers and I say, hey, the value of bank account is going to go up by 2%. You know, what packs more information? The 47%, right? I mean, uh, let, let, me, let me give you one, one more example. Okay? Let's, uh, let's say that, um, uh, can you handle a, a sensitive example here? Let's say that, uh, uh, boy, I, I want to do you harm. Okay? Let's say... I, I want to put you out. I, I, I want to kill you. Okay? Whoa. And I come at you with this, this pen here. And, and well, what are my odds? Can you, can you ferry against me? Can you put your hands? Could you push me? I mean, um, are there other things that can interfere with that goal? They are, right? But if I had this great big elephant gun, would you push me away? And, and, and would that be relatively effective? It wouldn't, right? And, and so this hyperinflationary difference, that's like the elephant gun, okay? It doesn't really matter what else is going on. This is, this is powerful information. That 47% difference, that's going <laughs> that's, that's, that's to dominate. And so, so what we find is that hyperinflation, when there's that difference, that the predictive power of this model is pretty good, both in the long and the short run. Okay, but when you only have a small inflationary, expected inflationary difference, you know, the long run still gives you time for in equilibrium the, the predicted power of the model to hold, but in the short run, there are reasons for deviations. And so, so let's, let's discuss this. So first of all, as I alluded to earlier, you know, all these changes, we're talking about nominal changes. And, and nominal consists of what two factors? Real and expected inflation, right? And so, basically, what we're saying is that, well, what if the exchange rate changes and it has nothing to do with expected inflationary differences? Well, if it has nothing to do with expected inflationary differences, then must it have to do with Real changes? It does, right? So, so in other words, you know, what, what kind of factors would change a country's real exchange rate? 
Or another way of putting it is, you know, what makes a currency more valuable or less valuable, even if there are no relative expected inflationary differences. So what about, for example, relative productivity? Okay, so, so imagine a, a country that is ahead of the game with a technological breakthrough and maybe it, it improves their productivity and so on and so forth. I don't know if this is true, but I maybe when the internet first came into being, okay, Mid ninety five, I think, is considered when uh, Netscape went public. I, I think is considered when the internet era really began. I mean, I know it'd been around, you know, a long time before that in in the world of academia and 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 maybe other worlds. But from a mass market point of view, um, let's say the mid nineties. So if I, I don't know if this is true, but if it is true that the United States m maybe. Um, had a two or three year lead on that relative to the rest of the world and it improved their productivity and and there were no expected inflationary differences ceteris paribus would you expect the dollar to become more attractive or less attractive presumably more attractive right with the the better productivity well maybe there are market structures you know free trade agreements you know, if if when 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 NAFTA was passed, and again I'm only using NAFTA because that seems to be such a famous one. Um, what did that do to the cost of doing business among Canada, United States, and Mexico? Presumably, it went down, right? And so, even if there are no inflationary differences as a result of that. Would you expect that to make the dollar more attractive or less attractive? Maybe more attractive, right? What about taste changes? What if just for some reason, you know, here's another sea story if you like. I remember, and apparently this is not true anymore, but I remember when I was in Russia that having American stuff was just really prestigious. This is pre-Berlin Wall falling down, so this is pre-1989, so this would have been you know, the late 70s, um, yeah, this would have been 76 or 70s, and, and 77, I went twice. I don't think I went in the 80s. But in any case, um, yeah, American jeans or, or whatever, uh, if, if you could get hold of them, that, that was just really prestigious. So even if there weren't any price differences, just the fact that there was a demand for American stuff, if, if that's the case, ceteris paribus, would that make the dollar strengthen or weaken? Make it strengthen, right? Here's another one. You know, change in the relative price of goods. So I'm not talking about the overall price changing or, or whatever, uh, but the relative price of goods. So yeah, I, I'm not an expert on any of this, but suppose I could take this bottle of water and I could pour it in my tank and it would operate my car for a year. What do you think would happen to the price of oil? Well, plummet, right? And the price of oil plummeted. Would it be fair to say that there were some currencies that would become net gainers and others net losers? There would, right? Depending upon, presumably, whether you're a what? Well, whether you're a net oil importer or exporter, right? Presumably that would make a big difference. And so that, that might be an example where even if it didn't affect prices, or, or, or if you factored out to the extent it did affect prices, you could imagine that would also have an impact on real exchange rates. We talked earlier about the ability to arbitrage goods and services, right? We've seen how this whole model relies on, well, we're talking about something whose price will adjust until there are no longer any arbitrage opportunities. And so even if we pull out the inf relative inflation parts, that's a situation where this model might not adjust. So, so for example, when I was talking about McDonald's earlier, right, and I talked about the labor, the cheap labor, you know, hey, is McDonald's going to fly over the, the, the uh, uh, labor from China and they'll operate the day shift and then fly them back? And, and, but I did say, you know, in, in the short run, that's, you know, 
I mean, first of all, I said that wouldn't happen. And secondly, I said, well, at least we wouldn't expect to hold in the short run. But in the long run, again, I don't know how long the long run is, okay? But in the long run, the more China engages in this kind of activity, what would you expect to happen to Chinese wages? Go up, right? In fact, we've seen this happen. In, in, I mean, in fact, you know, the uh, companies like Apple and other companies, what they're having to do is they're having to move their factories more and more towards rural China, more and more inland. Because the more inland you go, guess what's true about the price of labor there? Well, it's cheaper. And you gravitate towards the cities, and it becomes more expensive. So, so we already see, uh, or we are already seeing this adjustment in China. I also talked about sticky prices earlier, right? You know, the, the example with, hey, you know, oil's going down, and I go to my gas station, and it sure is taking time. It's time to show how much the cost of gas is going down. So in any case, those are all examples of why the real exchange rate might be expected to change, or real exchange rate does change. And, and this predict this the model, this model assumes basically that it's driven by relative expected inflation and nothing else. Okay, so so it, it it's it's ignoring all potential real changes. So if if you were in my class, then as I've mentioned before, what we would do is we would look at real world examples. There's always stuff going on in current events and and if you're watching this online and you're not in my class, again, I strongly encourage you to look for yourself. And yet, for example, maybe you have access to The Economist. You know, look at the latest article on the Big Mac Index. They, they come out with it, I think. When well, they come out with the numbers, I, I think weekly or, or, or monthly or whatever, but they come out with an article, I think, about every six months or so. So take a look at that stuff. In any case, so what we've done today was we've, we've maybe added one more cog, if you will, to why does the dollar go up and down in value? And so we've looked at the impact of relative inflation on exchange rates. And so hopefully we've added to our understanding of why the dollar or other currencies, for that matter, go up and down in value. So like I said, we're looking at this element of risk, and we'll look at managing this risk in future lectures. Either way, I hope this has been a good learning experience. As always, it's the goal is understanding, not memorization. And I hope you'll join me for future lectures. Thank you. Bye-bye.